wake up everybody, no more sleeping in bed, no more back to thinking, time for thinking ahead. The world has changed so very much from what it used to be. There's so much hatred, war and poverty. Oh. Hello. This is Tammy Williams with Things of Interest. How's everybody doing out there? This is me again, and this is a continuation of what we've aired for the past two um, episodes, and it's um, the Freedom Summer. And, you know, for those of you who haven't tuned in, um, it's about the voter registration that happened in Mississippi in 1960, in the 1960s. It started in 19, 1961 and then it went, it moved into um, 65, uh, you know, other years and um, until it was really, it was rectified. It, it took some time um, to, to make happen. Um, Mississippi was a hard state for African Americans, and they couldn't vote. It was in the uh, African American community was very oppressed, and SNCC, an organization, um, got together and came up with the idea of inviting about a thousand students into Mississippi um, from, you know, all over, um, all races, white people, black people, from all students from all over to come down to Mississippi to draw attention to the tension in Mississippi so that, um, you know, the African Americans would be able to vote. It was um, something that would, they would, wouldn't be able to do from the inside out. So they decided to try to do something from the outside in. And so we're going to continue with, you know, the Freedom Summer. So enjoy. And um, that was how I first heard of it. Everybody was to come into the auditorium for this session. They had this extremely solemn look on their faces. And then they told us that three uh, workers who had been at the orientation and had left early, uh, they had disappeared. I'm sorry. I neglected to tell you that where we left off last week was when um, three of the um, students that was at the orientation that you, you heard it, but I wanted to bring you up to speed. Um, this is when it really started to get dangerous. Um, and, you know, uh, when the three workers disappeared, you know, it was a very unfortunate um, uh, incident, you know, but you know, all things work together for the good. So, you know, God will turn what the devil means for bad into something good. So, you know, watch and, you know, pay attention. I urge people to contact their families and have their families contact their congressional people to indicate that we believe that there certainly was a possibility given the fact that so many hours had gone by and um, that they couldn't be located, Th that they might have been killed. The three civil rights workers who disappeared in Mississippi last Sunday night still have not been heard from. A search has thus far produced only one clue, the burned out station wagon in which the three were last seen riding. Andrew Goodman, a 20 year old college student from New York, James. Learning that three of our members, two of whom were white, had disappeared. Really blew away all my ideas that possibly we would have protection from the fact that the majority of the summer volunteers were white. I knew now that that was not the case, that everybody was in grave danger, and that these Mississippians would kill all of us. 
white and black. Bob said that there is no guarantee that you will get out of this summer alive. So just know that it's up to you if you want to continue on. So he left us all to the phones and we all went. We were told to call home. Did you talk this over with your parents before you made the decision? Yes, right. I discussed it with them. And they felt, of course, what I feel in it is fear of, of what might happen there. My mother and father did not ask me to come home. They asked me to do what I thought was right. So I boarded the buses. I'm going down to Mississippi. I'm going down a southern road. And if you never see me again, remember that I had to go. Remember that I had to go. It's a long road down to Mississippi. It's a short road back the other way. If the cops pull you over. We came down the interstate from Memphis into Mississippi. It must have been about four o'clock in the morning. There was a billboard right at the state line that said, welcome to Mississippi, the Magnolia State. And of course, there was a little bit of dread in, in seeing that. But what was more significant was that there were two Mississippi Highway Patrol cars parked under the sign. And as the buses came by, they pulled out and followed us. So at some level, they knew exactly when we were coming. Pouring out a state car, and he thinks he's fighting for his land. Yeah. What really is important is that they get down and kind of just melt away into the black population. If we could just get everybody through the entry point and into the community, the black community will house them and also harbor them. The, the genius of the Freedom Summer is that these volunteers were spread all over the state. The Freedom Summer workers are everywhere. They're in almost every little big town. Almost every place where you can go, they are there. Yesterday, the first 200 civil rights workers arrived in Mississippi and fanned out over the state. Another 800 will follow. The students were assigned living quarters in Negro homes from a central office. When Charles and, and uh, Bill came by the house and told us that they need some homes for the civil rights workers to live, I said, well, I don't have that much room. I said, but yeah, we'd be happy to do it, you know? And then I told my husband about it. He said, yeah, they can stay here. I felt the, the time had come to make, help make a change. I had three sons, and I didn't want them to go through what I had gone through and what I had seen. So I was determined to help make a change. I said, well, they'd have to take the twin beds, and the boys have to double up. They were happy over to know that somebody was coming from, all we had to do is say from Noah. <laughs> so people were willing to open their homes for the um, volunteers to, to stay while they helped to get people registered to vote. Um, in, you know, they lived, they lived, you know, close proximity together. But keep in mind that while they, they have just got into Mississippi, um, but the three um, organizers are still missing. I mean, those organizers, they hadn't even got really into the, um, the, the well, the volunteers hadn't got really into Mississippi even before um, those volunteers were taken. They, those, the three men that disappeared were like, like, um, 
you know, checking on things, you know, making sure things was going going well, you know, and uh, so it was hostility that even before they got started. We were now going to have a white person living in our house. So it was a special time, it was an exciting time. We weren't sure what they were going to be like because even though we had seen white people on television and in person, but to actually have someone living in our home to spend time with us, to share meals together, that was a much different type of relationship than what we had been accustomed to. They became a part of the black community. I don't know of any place that they could run into a white neighborhood and be accepted because they were outsiders. They became the closest thing to being a part of the black community as anybody can be because they had no choice. Walt Kaufman, you're from California. What's it like to uh, come into a situation such as exists here in Neshoba County and uh, as a white man come to work uh, for the project? Well, what I'm most impressed with is the response of the people here who uh, have been intimidated and terrorized for years and who know that uh, our presence here probably poses some danger for them, and yet they've shown tremendous courage and amazing hospitality to us. They've helped to feed us. They've uh, encouraged us. Uh, they've warmed us with their uh, just friendship and smiles and it's an extremely impressive experience to me everybody knew that we were going home at the end of the summer the people that took us in were going to stay so they were there for the reprisals uh, for the anger uh, that the white community had all the power to bring to bear on them and they did it because they really believed that we were there to help and they've never seen white people who had come to help in their whole lives. One of the most wonderful things about 1964 Mississippi summer were the Freedom Schools. The state of Mississippi deliberately and systematically kept black people uneducated and ignorant and then turned around and made education a requirement in order to participate in the political process. We were able to do the Freedom Schools in the summer of 1964 because we had almost a thousand students coming to the state of Mississippi, thus the human resources to actually, you know, conduct classes. We hope to find and develop and mold local leadership among the young people. We also hope to promote a better self-image among the local Negroes. We would send out mass uh, flyers and, and everything to the churches, uh, telling people about the Freedom School, what the Freedom School was going to entail, uh, the courses, uh, the activities. We got the preachers involved, we got the kids involved. to say right here um, that in adjacent to our votes being very, being very important, that it is important that we do um, utilize schools, you know, try to, you know, learn. You know, we, we don't always see that even though we all are, are very intelligent people, we can read and write, you know, everything is, is, is always changing rules. There's rules always being changed. So staying up on your education or, I mean, um, 
even if you have a young person or if you are a young person, I mean, you need to be, stay in there and know what type of changes are being made. And, and if you do get that knowledge, you know, take it home and share it with the people in your household. Because there's, I mean, always being something changed, something different, something, you know, and within within every, um, you know, job, every uh, profession, things are always being changed. So we have to really be mindful to always stay up on education and all the technology and all the, you know, the, the, the changes. Black people couldn't go to the library. It was for whites only. And so here they are, got their own library now. They would come excited to be exposed to the teaching and to browse the books. In the public schools where I was in school, I had never heard of Dr. Seuss. It was at Freedom School where we actually not only read the story of the cat in the hat, but we acted it out. Having our lives enriched by these activities really made a huge difference in my life. We taught um, African American history, civics, African culture, African dance. They were learning uh, black history, that they were reading books that had been written by blacks that they'd never heard of. How were slaves first introduced in America? As we saw back on this world map over here, America started picking up slaves along here and then bringing them back. What we were trying to do that summer is get people to talk about their own lives, talk about good and bad, and talk about ways in which you could bring about change. I think that was very much the drive of the, the program. They had a sense of being needed by something much bigger than themselves and a sense of being able to handle the problems that they were needed for. They did it by, by asking questions and by being encouraged to feel free to ask questions. They were raring to go. We were just kind of like the catalyst. We were agents of information and agents of a different world. So I mean, just the very fact that we were talking about a world that they didn't know or didn't have much experience with was exciting to them and also to us. We set them up uh, for the little children to come and every day we'd have classrooms of adults, people of 50, 60, 70 years of age. The adults came to the Freedom School to learn, just like the little children. Being in Freedom School planted a seed in my mind that things are going to change, things are going to be different, and Freedom Summer it helped to give us that courage, it helped to give us that hope, it helped to give us the reason to believe that it was going to be different. This is Backwoods, Mississippi, and it's two and a half million acres of swamp. Damp and clammy country, this hostile is the attitude of its white people to civil rights. The green slime that sprawls for miles may hide forever what's happened to Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner. As the search for the men intensifies in the swamps, there are those in Mississippi who do not seem disposed to see this as a personal tragedy. One of them is Mississippi's former governor, Ross Barnett. We will treat anyone with great respect here in Mississippi, anyone who comes here, as long as they do not disobey our laws. But we will treat the people who come here, these children, like any other backward Jew. Go Mississippi, keep rolling along. Go Mississippi, you cannot be wrong. They're outsiders coming down here trying to change the world, and, and there's natural resentment. I mean, that's common sense. We didn't think those people understood uh, what kind of society we had here. 
uh, you know, these college students would sit up there at Oberlin and there'd be an articulate, uh, well-groomed black person sitting next to them. And they assumed all blacks were like that, and they weren't. They're coming for the purpose of registering blacks to vote. And since this state had the highest percentage of blacks of any state in the United States, that posed a real threat politically. There was a siege mentality, us against them, and I hated them. Your song, M I S S. Well, at least he was honest. There were white people who, you know, felt that they, it was their right to keep um, their state the way they wanted it to and, you know, appreciate their honesty and, and um, you know, coming out right out and saying that they hated that the, the students were there. Let me state as clearly as I can what the mindset of the state of Mississippi was, encouraged and emboldened by the utterances of its politicians. If the white people of Mississippi will just stay together, will just stick together, there is no force in this country that will cause segregation to be ended. That was the mindset. We face absolute extinction of all we hold dear, unless we are victorious, we can win. My friends, if we are organized in every community in Mississippi and all over this nation of ours, we must be stronger than the enemy. We must be strong enough to crush the enemy. They're caught in a circle which if there are people who want to break out, they don't know how. They don't have a chance, they, they just, white people are probably more oppressed or in terms of their ability to speak than Negroes. In the South, you were expected to live a certain way. You just didn't step outside the bubble. In August of 1963, I was crowned Miss Mississippi and was spent the next year representing Mississippi uh, all over. Red Hafner and his wife were of loyal Mississippians. The daughter was Miss Mississippi, and they really believed that if they just invited a couple white volunteers over to their house in Macomb just for dinner, just to find out what was going on, nothing, nothing would happen, nobody would object, but they miscalculated badly. The whole purpose was just to keep the peace, to try not to have any more bombings, try not to have any more killings. They came over just to have tea or whatever, or coffee. Then shortly after that, a man called, a neighbor, that we didn't know very well, and he lives a good distance from us, and said the neighbors were upset about this car that was in front of our house. And who did it belong to? And about 10 minutes later, uh, Red Hefner opened his front door, and there were all these headlights glaring at him, like something out of a bad movie. And people started shouting things and they just barely got the people out there. And from then on, the Hefner's life in Mississippi was pure hell. I went downtown one day, and friends that I had known for 10 years would turn and walk away from me or hang their heads. Some would speak and walk on, as if I had leprosy or something. My father was asked to move out of his office, so he lost his business. Our, you know, our little dog was killed. I came home to visit uh, because I was still traveling as Miss Mississippi and the FBI wouldn't let me go home. I had to stay in the Holiday Inn because they had heard that the house was going to be bombed. It's just gotten to uh, the point that uh, we couldn't take it any longer. It's a mark of the obsession 
that so many white people had in this state at that time with maintaining segregation that made them turn on their neighbors, on their friends. The Hefners were ostracized socially and finally had to leave the state. They left everything they'd ever had behind. When all your roots are in one place, it breaks your heart. I saw in Mississippi a white population that I had never even imagined existed. The vile, the absolute hatred that was in their eyes when they saw us coming was, it, 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 it scared me. It's night, it's hot. Violence hangs overhead like dead air. It hangs there, and maybe it will fall. Although I was extremely tired, every shadow, every noise, the bark of a dog, the sound of a car, in my fear and exhaustion, I turned into a terrorist approach, and I believe- I wake up in the morning, sighing with relief that I was not bombed, because I know that they know where I live, and I think, well, I got through that night, and I have to get through this day. And it goes on and on. There were always moments when I just uh, wondered if I could make it through that day to the next one, and then to the next one. Just always questioning, always wondering. Every time I walked out on the street, I, in my mind, I expected a bullet to hit me. They threw a stick of dynamite where now? Now, what, what, did, what damage did it do? Freedom Summer was one of the most violent periods in Mississippi history since the end of Reconstruction. There were over a thousand arrests made. The explosive, nobody knows what kind or how much, was apparently placed up against the house or rolled up against the house 65 buildings were either bombed or burned, including 35 churches. There were 100 or so beatings. I mean, this was going on all over the state. And then there was the whole issue of white women living in black homes. I mean, that just infuriated them. Take uh, take these uh, the white white women that have been imported in here. They, they, they call them call them white women. I could call them a light colored rat. They used to stay and sleep in the same damn house that did uh, that did uh, negros negro do, and and then tell them tell them tell them tell them me that they, that that they uh, not sexual relations. That why that's. That is, a, that is a for, the, for the, the birds. Even walking down the street in an interracial group was kind of a no-no. I remember being arrested and being asked a lot of questions, and the sheriff wanted me to describe the size of black men's penises. They were obsessed with sex. I don't think we were obsessed with sex, but it was a clear message that that's all they thought we were doing. Wow. If you got in any just, kind of trouble at all, or anybody was threatened. I just got blown away with that. I'm sorry for uh, the technical difficulties. I, I wanted to close it down, and I'm going to have to close it down. But just to say that they wanted people to do the things that um, we heard about. It's just un unconscionable, you know. But this is Tammy Williams. This is Things of Interest. This is our times and dates. It's our emails if you'd like to contact us. I, you know, it's it just, it's terrible under the conditions. If you, you just think back to the conditions that you just, you just, um, you just heard about um, all the bombings, all the churches, all the homes, you know, just all the anger and the violence over the African Americans' right to vote. So this is Tammy Williams. We'll be back again before you uh, next week. 
God bless you. What you have to say. They're the ones who's coming up, and the world is in their hands. When you teach the children to jump the very best you can. But just let it be. Na, 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 na. The world won't get.